Okay, welcome to lecture 31. So in the last class we had seen how the entropy inequality and objectivity was used to get information about the constitutive relation. Okay, and I'll just summarize what we have gotten. So we found that the Helmholtz free energy psi is a function of right Cauchy green tensor C and temperature theta. Okay. And then the first Viola Kirchhoff stress tensor P turned out to be two times rho naught into big F times del psi by del C. Okay. Then the entropy eta, specific entropy, turned out to be minus del psi by del theta. And then finally, the heat flux Q naught, we said that it is some function Q naught hat of C theta and gradient of theta. Okay. And all this is subjected to the reduced entropy inequality, which is Q naught, this function Q naught hat and dot with gradient of theta. So that's less than equal to zero. Okay, that's a reduced entropy inequality. And you can recall that from here, you can then find out anything else. Even the internal energy, for example. So internal energy is simply, we know that it is psi plus eta theta. So this then becomes psi hat function up there, minus del psi by del theta into theta. Isn't it? That's where entropy is, sorry, internal energy. And uh, later on, you also found out that the um, yeah the Cauchy stress tensor sigma. Do you remember that uh, this turned out to be one over j? I mean, we know this is one over j times p times f transpose. We have derived we have derived it earlier. And for P, when you put it from up here, then we get 1 by J, 2 rho naught, F del psi by del C into F transpose, right? Which is simply 2 times rho times F del psi by del C into F transpose. So you also have the formula for sigma, Cauchy stress tensor. Okay, and we had seen that with second law thermodynamics or with the entropy inequality together with objectivity, the A and B is getting automatically satisfied, isn't it? So this is all the consequence of entropy inequality, very magical. plus objectivity. Okay, and uh, and we see that the sigma, the way it is coming out to be, it is also equal to sigma transpose. So the A and B is getting automatically satisfied. Okay, so we have done it in the last class. All right, so let's proceed further from here. Now let's look at what happens to first law of thermodynamics or the energy equation. So before that, we can look at 
rho naught epsilon dot because this figures in the energy equation. So that's equal to rho naught psi plus eta theta and whole dot, which is equal to rho naught psi dot and psi being a function of c and theta. You can write it as rho naught del psi over del f into f dot double contraction f dot right plus del psi by del theta into theta dot right plus eta dot theta plus eta times theta dot okay and of course you can also I mean, we can also write it for eta. Eta, we know that it is minus of del psi by del theta, right? So, but let me put it as eta dot theta only because you will see that there will be some cancellation. Plus eta theta dot. And, uh, okay. Then we know that rho naught del psi del f is basically your first Biola Kirchhoff stress tensor. So this is same as P double contraction F dot, which is the stress power, right? Plus rho naught into, look at this thing. This is same as minus eta, right? So as you can see, this and this get canceled. And what you have then remaining is just rho naught times eta dot theta. So that's why I didn't want to put what eta is, but now we can do that. Now we see that only rho naught eta dot theta remains. So we can write it as rho naught theta times eta dot. And eta is minus del psi by del theta. So we have to do minus del psi by del theta and the whole dot. Okay, and this we will write it as P double contraction F dot. And uh, plus rho naught theta. Okay, I can also bring that minus up here. And then we apply simply the product rule, sorry, chain rule, del, del to psi by del c del theta double contraction c dot plus del to psi by del theta del theta double contraction theta dot, isn't it? Okay. And then uh, we can then look at what is the first law of thermodynamics or the energy equation. If you guys remember or recall, then this was P double contraction F dot minus the Lagrangian divergence of heat flux, referential heat flux, plus rho naught small r. And that's equal to rho naught epsilon dot. Okay. So you can see that there are some cancellations because rho naught epsilon dot is what you have up here. So it has the first term is P double contraction F dot which get cancelled from the left hand side. And therefore you have finally minus divergence dot Q dot plus rho naught R. And that's equal to what is remaining here, which you remember it is rho naught theta eta dot, but it is turning out to be minus rho naught theta del two psi by del c del theta double contraction c dot plus del to psi by del theta 2 into theta dot. Okay, so far it looks very good. So this is the energy equation. 
and then you also have your uh, LNB equation, which is simply divergence of Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor, and that uh, we can write as rho naught del psi by del f, right? Plus the body force, and that's equal to rho naught into velocity dot or acceleration. <coughs> so these are the two equations, which is now you can see it is what unknowns are present here. So it's basically four equations for four unknowns, which is y hat and theta. Okay. So four PDEs for the four unknowns, and this has to be solved together with the boundary condition that we have discussed and the initial condition, right? If you are solving a dynamics problem. Okay, so it's quite good so far. And I'll also say that, you know, often for this uh, heat flux, referential heat flux Q naught, You might recall this uh, Fourier law. So we call it generalized Fourier law. So this Q naught is simply minus some second order tensor K, which is a function of C and theta, times gradient of theta. It's a generalized Fourier law. Fourier law of heat conduction, you remember? This, the simpler Fourier law was that Q naught is equal to some minus constant K times grad theta. So this is if you have isotropic Fourier law, whereas this is a generalized Fourier law, an isotropic Fourier law. But also, so this is not uh, as general as saying that you have this function Q naught of c theta grad x theta because you can see that it is still linear in grad theta whereas over here we don't know how it is okay so often this is used in the equation up here all right then uh, Another remark that we can discuss is about the entropic production. So you remember when we were doing this uh, uh, second law of thermodynamics, the final thing that remained was uh, the entropy inequality was rho naught eta dot, and you had then minus rho naught little r by theta, and uh, Plus, please uh, correct me if I'm making some mistake, divergence of x dot q naught by theta. Is it? And this was greater than equal to zero. And if you remember for the body, for the body, this was, uh, um, So if you say what's the entropy production in the body, so rate of entropy production So this is the local production, which we said it has to be greater than or equal to zero. So for the entire body, you simply have the same thing, but integrated over the body. Or let's say part of the body d ref you have rho naught eta dot minus rho naught little r by theta plus divergence dot q naught by theta okay and we know that this has to be greater than or equal to zero now this thing we can uh, in the light of 
this new form for energy equation. We can make slight modification. And so let us see what is this going to become. So this is going to become integral over d ref rho naught eta dot minus rho naught little r by theta. And this one, I think uh, we have also seen it. This is one by theta. Then divergence of q naught minus q naught dot gradient of theta divided by theta square. Okay. And this has to be greater than equal to zero. And uh, if we substitute this reduced or the new form of first law of thermodynamics, you see, then uh, that's here, this whole thing and it simply goes away due to first law of thermodynamics or energy equation, I should say. Okay, and so therefore the entropy production is simply the integral over the reference volume and with a minus sign Q naught dot gradient theta by theta square and that has to be greater than or equal to zero i think it is fine okay so that's the entropy production and you see that this is positive the for the thermoelastic process that we have been discussing here because we substituted the energy equation for thermoelastic material no so this holds only for thermoelastic material, only for thermoelastic material. So what you see is that this is, the entropy production is always, even though it is thermoelastic, you know, someone might have thought, oh, it is thermoelastic, then there should not be any entropy production, but that's not the case. Even for thermoelastic, because there is some conduction going on within the body, so that conduction leads to entropy generation. So this Q naught is leading to entropy generation. All right. So yeah, DVX is missing, but I think uh, all of you can now see that. Yeah, that's trivial. And from here, you see that if grad theta is zero, so if the motion is such that if the Lagrangian gradient of theta is zero, that means you have uniform temperature in the body, then uh, this entropy production is zero, isn't it? You know, one also says that if grad theta is zero, one then says that the body is in thermal dynamic equilibrium. Because you might remember that for thermal equilibrium, body is in thermal equilibrium. So for thermal equilibrium, the temperature has to be the same, right? Two bodies are in thermal equilibrium if they have the same temperature. And for a continuum body, We'll say that it's in thermal equilibrium if grad theta is zero. That means theta is same everywhere. And then there is also the concept of local thermal equilibrium. That means so if at a point in the body locally grad theta is zero, then we say that the body is in thermal equilibrium at the local point. So body is in local thermal equilibrium. And if it is everywhere grad theta zero, then it is globally in thermal equilibrium. Okay, let's uh, you know then also introduce the concept of 
what's called a specific heat. OK, so. First of all, the energy, internal energy. So we saw that this is equal to psi plus eta times theta. And the entropy, this specific heat is defined as the specific heat. And there are two of them, specific heat at constant volume and specific heat at constant strain. OK, and I'm going to talk about a specific heat at. Sorry, a specific constant volume and the one at constant pressure. So I'm going to talk about specific heat at sort of constant volume, but for the solid bodies, it is like at constant strain. So that we are going to denote by C. OK, that's a, the book says that small c so it's a function of then big c and theta because it's simply the derivative of internal energy with respect to theta okay so this is done at constant c because keeping c constant is like keeping strain constant okay now let us see what will this turn out to be so I think we have have we done it earlier for the derivative of epsilon? Yeah, we have it. But maybe let's try to do it again. So we can come back here and then we say that this is del over del theta of psi plus eta theta at constant C. So this is then going to be, so we can write it as del psi hat by del theta plus del eta hat by del theta plus eta hat, right? And this, Derivatives are all done at constant C. And then you see that these two are cancelling from the constitutive relation. So finally you have del eta by del theta and eta is minus of uh, del psi by del theta. So this is finally minus del two psi by del theta two. Okay, and remember it's at constant C. All right, so. And I guess there's some theta also missing here. Yeah, so there was a theta here. So that theta is also going to come. Minus theta times del to psi by del theta two. OK, so in light of this, the fact that theta minus of theta times del two psi by del theta two is actually a specific heat. That if you go back to the energy equation that we had derived, you know, this energy equation, it has, you see one term here, del two psi by del theta two with a minus sign theta, right? So that's your specific heat, no? So with that in mind, you can then write the energy equation as minus divergence of Q naught plus rho naught times bulk heat energy generation rate. So that's equal to rho naught into C into theta dot minus rho naught times theta times del two psi hat by del theta del c double contraction c dot. Okay, that's so in terms of a specific heat. 
and you know often we deal with problems where the body is rigid there's no deformation but the heat is flowing in the body so that's often that you do when you're solving a heat transfer problem a purely heat transfer problem and uh, the body is like a rigid body and it's just the heat that is flowing Okay, so for such a case, your C dot is then going to become zero, right? So if C dot is zero, you no, know, for example, rigid body. If that's the case, then this energy equation reduces to the following. Okay. And it has several application, not just for fluid mechanics, you know, where the temperature, whenever your fluid body, the temperature is often changing in the space, but also for solid body, you know, these days, for example, we have the concept of additive manufacturing where the material is deposited or material is also cut through laser processes. So then the you, know, you have this body and uh, there will be a source of heat which will just be flowing. So it, it is giving you that small r is then there and also heat is changing. But we assume that the deformation is not happening. Whatever the material has gotten deposited, it just gets frozen. There is no deformation. So there we people often apply this law. This equation where uh, C dot is assumed to be zero. OK, but of course, in the vicinity where the heat is, you know, where the laser source is there, the body is melting. So indeed, deformation is happening there. So if you want to be more careful, then you have to work with the general equation. OK, but otherwise, as an approximation, one can also work with this reduced equation. Just like we thought of the Helmholtz free energy being dependent on big F and theta, one can, there's an, an analog where we think of internal energy depending on big F and entropy eta. These are two different approaches. Either you think of Helmholtz energy, you think in terms of Helmholtz energy, and then the argument is F and theta, or you think of in terms of internal energy, but then the argument is F and eta. And just by knowing, as you saw, just by knowing Helmholtz free energy, you are able to get all the constitutive relations except for q naught of course similarly just by knowing this internal energy in terms of f and eta you will be able to derive everything else okay so notice that in this approach eta is the basic variable not theta so entropy becomes a basic variable and there is some discussion about that on uh, page number 212. So if you go to page 212 and remark 8 of the book, there's some discussion about this. Okay, do read this. So I'm going to then proceed to our next topic, which is very, very important topic. And I think many of you have been looking forward to it. And that's about material symmetry. Okay, and it is this property, you know, that allows you to write down specific energy forms for isotropic bodies or transversely isotropic bodies or orthotropic bodies or, you know, many other kind of bodies. So this isotropy or transverse isotropy or orthotropy, these are different forms of material symmetry. Okay. 
and there's a very nice mathematics which allows you to further give extra information about this psi. Since till now we have just gotten that the psi is a function of c and theta after using entropy. But using this extra information of symmetry, material symmetry, you will be able to say more about this Helmholtz energy function psi. Okay, so to see how that happens, we have to first understand what is material symmetry, isn't it? So let's talk about that now. So, you know, we have this, uh, we saw from a verb that the Cauchy stress tensor sigma has this function sigma hat depending on f, isn't it? Remember from the above, it was uh, two times rho into f into del psi by del f. So del psi by del c times f transpose. Okay, so so from here you can see that sigma hat is indeed a function of f. So there is a force dependence on c on Helmholtz free energy, but then you have also f appearing explicitly. So therefore, sigma hat is like a function of f, the Cauchy stress that generates in the body. Okay, but then F, whenever you have this F, that means you have some reference configuration because F is always defined relative to the reference configuration, right? The gradient is with respect to referential coordinates for big F. Now think that, uh, you know, you have the same body but then you are analyzing it through two reference configurations. Okay, so this is, for example, J ref one, I'll say, and this is J ref two. And the body is here, the current configuration of the body is here. So that's your Jai, the configuration, right? And suppose you are looking at a point in the body, let's call it the point P. So this point will be somewhere over here, right? And here in, in here also, it will be somewhere over here. Okay. So, the map from here to here, so because it is coming from the reference configuration 2, we can say that this is F2. Okay? And the map from here to here, we can say that that's F1. All right. But if I ask you this question, what is sigma in the body? Is it going to depend on the reference configuration? Let us see. Let us suppose you do analysis with respect to this reference configuration and find out some sigma in this current configuration of the body. And you do another analysis with respect to this reference configuration and again find out sigma. Will they be different or they will be the same? What do you think? Okay, Biswa says it will be the same. Anybody disagreeing with it that it will be different? So yeah, it will be it will be the same, isn't it? From physics, because sigma is like the true stress in the body. It just depends on the current state of the body, sigma. 
because you see sigma times the current normal gives you the traction in the body so here everything so you have this uh, formula that traction in the body is sigma times n but traction t is the force per unit current area so you see in this formula everything is current there is no information of the reference configuration in this formula traction and n they are all current so therefore sigma should also be current sigma should also depend just on the current configuration so that's why sigma is also called true stress it is independent of what reference configuration you choose okay but you can't say the same for the first pula kirchhoff stress tensor for example because first in the first pula kirchhoff stress tensor you have t not isn't it that's a pula traction being equal to p times n x so this is n y here it is n x so this n x is dependent on what reference configuration you have chosen so for the same plane over here which has n y as normal in this configuration you could have n x 1 as the normal whereas in this configuration the same plane will have n x 2 as the normal they won't be the same so there are two different reference configurations so you can see that in this formula nx is dependent on the reference configuration but what comes out t not has the same direction as t so direction of t not is not changing but the magnitude is changing because the force is per unit reference area so reference area will be different in the different configuration so you can see that there is dependence on reference configuration in this relationship and therefore p will be dependent on reference configuration but sigma will be not okay now if you think in terms of constitutive equation then we can say that the same sigma in one time we will write as a function sigma 1 Okay, a function sigma one, and depending on f one, whereas you can write the same as another function sigma two, but depending on f two, isn't it? i believe uh, you are all fine with it see the the function because uh, the f's are different one has f1 and the other has f2 the function should must be different right if you have two different reference configuration because the function has f as an argument and f depends on reference configuration so the function the sigma hat function therefore it's different one has sigma 1 hat and the other one has sigma 1 sigma 2 hat having so basically it's a two different functions i hope you you guys are following what i'm saying so you have two different functions but it has to give you the same result the outcome sigma must be the same i think uh, it's not a problem really isn't it it's just like you are solving the same problem twice one using configuration one as the reference configuration and the, the second problem you are using second configuration as the reference configuration and both the problems have their own constitutive functions sigma 1 hat and sigma 2 hat 
And in both the problems, the deformation gradient that you are supplying is whatever is there in that problem. So in one problem, you have F1 as the deformation gradient, and in the other problem, you have F2 as the deformation gradient. OK. Now, another thing very interesting is that. <clears throat> you know, we can also relate the two configurations. You can go from configuration one to configuration two, for example. Isn't it using some uh, because it's the body, right? So you can think of. A deformation gradient edge relating local material lines in configuration one to material lines in configuration two. So edge is basically relating the two reference configurations. OK, so in that way, if you see it carefully. Then you have a process in which you are going from configuration one to the current configuration. But you have another process in which configuration two is an intermediate configuration. So you go from first from configuration one to two and then from two to current configuration. But finally you are reaching the same current configuration. But can we say that F1 for process one would be same as F2 into H? Can you say that? And why is that so? Because you see, think of a line here. Dx. That changes to suppose dx hat and finally the same line is changing to dy then this map says that dy is equal to f1 into dx right whereas this map says that dx hat is equal to h into dx correct and then this map says that dy is equal to f2 into dx hat but this you can also write as F2 into dx hat being h times dx. Okay. And then you can make the comparison of this with this. And you can see that F1 is there for F2 times h. Right? So therefore, you can rewrite this as Sigma one hat of F two times H is same as Sigma two hat of F two, right? So you see, this is going to hold for any deformation. We haven't yet come to what is called uh, material symmetry. We haven't yet used that. This is something which is uh, like a truth. It's going to hold always. OK. And then F2 is like a general deformation gradient. It depends on the deformation. So F2 is arbitrary. So we can finally say that Sigma 1 hat. Instead of F2, we just write F of FH is same as sigma 2 hat of f okay are you guys okay with me so far
And here, we know that f is uh, such that that f has to be greater than zero because it's relating to configurations, right? And we know that the determinant of f is always greater than zero. And likewise, h also because it is relating to configurations. The two reference configuration, therefore, determinant of h is also it's not equal to zero hundred percent, right? But we are not uh, saying that it be greater than zero because you will see that later on while doing symmetry we will also allow reflection of configuration. So you see these are just the reference configurations, no? So we'll also allow the two reference configurations to be related by related through reflection. So therefore, determinant of H can also be negative. Because you see, this is perfectly fine because there's no motion happening here in going from one reference configuration to other ref reference configuration. If the two reference configurations were being realized through a motion, then only determinant of H would have to be greater than zero. But here, the two reference configurations are just, it just comes out of the blue. They are not related through a motion. So therefore, you can relate them through an H such that it is non-singular, it is just non-singular. What will this uh, stress function look like and who will decide that how the stress function is going to look like? Anybody? Can someone tell me? Who is going to decide how the stress function is going to look like? If you say it's going to depend on the motion, the stress function will depend on the motion. The answer is not correct because motion is will tell me what's the output sigma and the dependence of the motion is in the argument on the is in the argument of the function not on the how the function what's the formula of the function that's something else so what will be the formula of the function what will that depend on So formula of this function, what will it depend on? So if you're not able to answer, then think of uh, the formulas that you have seen. What kind of formulas have you guys seen for sigma? You have seen formulas for isotropic bodies, for transversely isotropic, for orthotropic. So you get different formulas for these bodies, right? So why are they different? Because the body is different. The body has different symmetry or the, the microstructure of the body is different. Therefore, the formulas are different, right? So we can say that it actually depends on microstructure of the body. Is the body like an isotropic body that it has same property in all directions? Then the formula will be like an isotropic formula. Or if it is something else, then the formula will be something else. Isn't it? Now coming to another question. Very interesting question, actually. There can be. There can be some configurations. Or there can be two configurations related by H. Such that. The. Response function 
is the same. So what I mean to say is that there can be two configurations related by H such that sigma 1 hat is equal to sigma 2 hat. Right, it is, it is possible, right? So I'm going to stop here basically because we are running out of time. So we'll meet in the next class and start from here.